All right, so today we're on Daniel chapter 6, a beautiful, wonderful chapter with lots of encouragement. Um, And, you know, I think it fits really nicely with the second Sunday. It's supposed to be the second Sunday after Christmas, but we all know better than that. It's the second Sunday of Christmas, right? It's, we're in Christmas still, right? We're not past Christmas. Um, So anyway, uh, the readings on the second Sunday of Christmas are a little on the dark side, wouldn't you say, right? Um, You know, don't be surprised when you suffer. That's what you're called to in first, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, and of course, the murdering of the baby boys at uh, Greater Bethlehem by Herod, because uh, he's insane. Well, because he's, he's uh, a monster, right? Um, and, uh, and we have, you know, again, we have sort of the government attacking uh, Daniel. We've had this before in Daniel, the book. We've had it kind of over and over again in Daniel. Um, and, uh, and now, uh, uh, this time, well, it's, there's some beautiful differences between this and uh, the fiery furnace with the big, uh, the big statue, right? Um, what is it in, in Veggie Tales, a giant chocolate Easter bunny? Wasn't it that they were supposed to bow down to? And for, anyway, and uh, where they come up with that, I don't know. So anyway, well, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless our study of your holy word. Give us your Holy Spirit in that word, as your spirit is in that word, that we may hear this word, take it to heart, be encouraged and strengthened by it, um, especially in these gray and latter days, uh, allow us ever to know that you are the God of history, that you are working all things together for our good, and especially you are working for our salvation through, uh, well, Daniel's Lord and ours, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose and lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so Daniel chapter 6, although I want to back up one verse uh, to uh, chapter 5, verse 31, which in the, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, which interestingly still is Aramaic at this point, but in the, in the Masoretic text, uh, chapter 5, verse 31 is actually chapter 6, verse 1. Um, and you could make an argument either way. I think Luther put this verse in chapter 5, which is why it shows up that way for us. Um, uh, but it, in the, again, in the Masoretic text, it's the first verse of chapter 6. It is, it is a, a transition from chapter 5 to chapter 6. Chapter 5, you remember, was the handwriting on the wall when uh, Bel- uh, Belshazzar, uh, the co-regent, who's ruling over uh, Babylon, throws uh, a, uh, a big party and pulls out the sacred vessels from the temple and uses them for their drinking uh, party. And, uh, and this is, of course, desecrating the holy things of God and, and mocking God. Um, and then uh, God says, you know, uh, you've been weighed in the balance and you are found not worthy and you're going to die. And then that very night he dies, which uh, would be uh, when the, the, the Persian army conquers Babylon, which was October 12th, 539 BC. Um, and then uh, verse 31, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Um, so I'll be 62 on April Fool's Day, mind you. So I, that's great. This is really fitting that I get to do this. Um, th- so, uh, you know, Darius is a really old codger. I mean, it's hardly <laughs> amazing he's able to stand up at all. Um, and uh, uh, he's, anyway. Uh, now, who, 
Okay, so Darius the Mede receives the kingdom. Some make the argument that because he receives the kingdom, he can't possibly be the king of Persia because the king of Persia defeated the Babylonians and he took the kingdom, right? He defeated the Babylonians, um, which by the way is great news for Israel, right? This is gonna be really good news that the Persians are wiping out the Babylonians. Uh, the Babylonians stole the Israelites out of, uh, out of Israel. They destroyed the temple uh, and they see uh, the Jews as somewhat useful to them, some of them, but they're basically slaves. Um, whereas the Persians don't have that history with Israel. And so they wipe out the Babylonians, which uh, interestingly, Daniel works for the Babylonian government and the Persians take over and he doesn't get like beheaded or whatever, which um, that's kind of interesting on its own, isn't it? But, but the Persians come in, they, they win. And then it says here that Darius received the kingdom. So the argument is Darius can't possibly be the king of Persia uh, who just conquered because he receives the kingdom. The king of Persia gave it to him would be why it says received. Although in Daniel, pretty consistently, uh, God is giving, God's the one ruling the history. And if you remember back in chapter two, um, when uh, we had Nebuchadnezzar's dream, uh, chapter two, verse 21, well, uh, 20, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding, and he reveals stuff. So if you're a king, that's because God puts you in that place. Um, it's not because you're so great that you did this on your own, right? And I think that fits then uh, with a couple other facts that make us think that Darius is another name for uh, uh, Cyrus the second or Cyrus the great uh, who is the king of Persia uh, his uh, so this is Darius the Mede we have found no historical records anywhere with this Darius the Mede there are other Dariuses later but uh, interestingly Darius the first is after this so that tells you this prop there's no record of a Darius. So what's going on? Um, well, uh, Steinman argues in his excellent commentary by, uh, uh, in the Concordia commentary series. Have you had a class with him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a little brighter than I. I haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a bright bulb. Um, very bright man. And, you know, nicely, you know, like sharp and, and yet kind of humble too, right? Yeah, yeah he's a good guy. Um, uh, he, he argues that this has got to be, uh, well, not got to be, but likely is Cyrus II, this Darius, um, because we've got no written records of Darius, although we didn't have any records of Belshazzar, as you remember, until the 1800s when they found the records of him from chapter 5. So may, maybe, maybe we'll find records of this guy. But, uh, but he's the same age as Cyrus. Cyrus dies in 530 BC at age 70, which means in 539 he could be 62, all right, at this point. Um, so uh, that, that lines up. Um, Cyrus is the Persian king, yet this guy is Darius the Mede. Uh, Cyrus's mom was uh, a Mede. Um, dad was a Persian, so and and in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies, like in Isaiah, about the fall of Babylon, it's the the Medes are going to do this. The Medes are going to wipe out the Babylonians. Um, so that would be why Daniel would want to emphasize that Darius is a Mede. Okay, it's the the he's united the Medes and the Persians together as one kingdom, one army. Uh, so uh, that would be the reason to bring up uh, 
to call him not Cyrus, the Persian king, but Darius the Mede. Um, notice it doesn't say he's the king of the Medes, uh, because again, the Persians had, the Persian and Medes had joined together, so he's, he's the Persian king, not the, the king of the Medes, but he is a Mede, at least half Mede. Uh, and uh, let's see, what else about this? Um, uh, yeah, well, I think that's about it. Uh, so that, uh, so I'm gonna go that way. I'm gonna say this is Cyrus, all right, for the sake of argument. Um, if you go digging around and find cuneiform tablets that tell us about this Darius guy, I'll, I'll, that he is a different guy, I'll believe you. But um, until then, I'm going with Cyrus. So um, uh, now, so he takes over right after the fall of Babylon, right? Daniel was there at the fall of Babylon, right? He was telling, uh, Belshazzar, the co-regent who was ruling over uh, Babylon, told them that it was going to end. Uh, and now we get chapter 6. So Darius, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 uh, satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one to whom the satraps would give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Um, actually, uh, this, this happened over a fair bit of time. Uh, so uh, uh, Darius uh, Cyrus comes in, uh, takes over, and he has a, a co-regent or a, a governor he appoints to run Babylon at the beginning, um, uh, a guy named, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's G-U-B-U-R-A, -B I think, uh, uh, Gabura. Um, he's the general who conquers Babylon. He takes over at first and he starts to appoint some of these regional administrators, these satraps. Um, uh, but uh, he dies shortly after he takes over. He, he lasts maybe, I don't know, two, three months, something like that. So then Cyrus comes in and he continues to appoint these. It would take a while. Right? You gotta figure out uh, who's gonna be loyal to you and who isn't, who knows how to relate to the Babylonians. Right? Imagine if somebody, some government took over the United States, or well, or we took over Afghanistan, right? Who can you trust in the local government? Who's gonna, who's gonna work with the Americans? Who's gonna betray you, right? And you need local leaders to help you rule so that they know kind of the customs and the people and all that stuff, right? So uh, this is a complicated process, getting these guys all named. And you can tell, I think, that uh, Cyrus Darius is a, is a wise guy in, that in this regard. He recognizes that he's not sure who he can trust yet. So over these 120 administrators, regional administrators, he puts three presidents, um, uh, three men to kind of rule over those guys. Uh, now why three? Uh, well, it's, you don't know who to fully trust yet. So you can't put one guy in charge because he might, might not be trustworthy. So this, is, uh, this becomes really important in this account that he appoints three guys to rule over. And I don't know why he picked Daniel, doesn't tell us. Um, it could be that, you know, as he interviewed people, he found out that Daniel had, you know, been successful and was honored and all that. Could be because he was a third ruler um, when this happened and he was respectful to Cyrus. I don't, I don't know. Um, regardless, so he appoints these 120 satraps and then the, uh, the three presidents over that. By the way, there is an argument that 120 is way too many administrators, too many regions for, uh, for Babylon, uh, but we have historic evidence that in other places there were actually more regional administrators than this. And if we know anything about government, 
you know, you can have a lot of bureaucracy. So um, this can happen. Um, and oh, um, I, I, I should say, uh, we do kind of know why Daniel got picked, excuse me, verse 3. Then, Dan, then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Uh, so as he's put in this position uh, over the satraps, he, he rises to the top, right? He's, I, look, we know Daniel in the past. He was respectful to King Nebuchadnezzar, even when he disagreed with him, right? Um, and he, he was willing to say to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, this thing of asking your wise men to come up with a dream that you're not revealing to them, that's not fair. Nobody does that. You can't do that, right? So Daniel's, um, Daniel's respectful and yet uh, not afraid to give the truth to those in authority, which if you're someone in authority, you need somebody that's going to tell you the truth. Um, and he did even say it to uh, Belshazzar. He gave what the dream meant, that he, or the handwriting on the wall meant, that he was going to die, even though, boy, you'd be scared of telling a king that, because he could just chop your head off. Um, but Daniel does it. Daniel's a man of integrity, faithful, trusts the Lord. His name means, by the way, that uh, Elohim is my judge, right? So a uh, God is his judge. He trusts him rather than man. So um, like Joseph, when he ends up in, uh, even in the prison um, and with Potiphar and all that, he always rises to the top, right? He, uh, Potiphar puts him in charge of everything except his wife. And then when he gets thrown into a prison, he, he becomes in charge of the whole prison. Right, I, I must, I'd be a riot to know Joseph, right? This guy, you know, kind of everything he, he does goes well, and so he rises up Daniel too. And uh, which, by the way, you know, use your intelligence and hard work and skill and all that to serve your neighbor, even if your neighbor's a total pagan, even if your employer isn't Christian or whatever, so what? You, you work hard, you do your best. Um, I know there's people that work at Herman's Boy and do really good work, even though the original owner is pretty much a jerk. But that is, um, <laughs> ah, just kidding, Flake. Um, so, you, uh, you know, every now and then, I, I hear about the crazy things that go on in corporate America, where they give you diversity training or other stuff and whatever. Well, you know, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know, listen politely during the diversity training. I probably wouldn't wrestle there. I don't think that's, you're not gonna get very far um, fighting the HR department. Um, and then just do an incredibly good job so that they can't possibly wanna get rid of you even if uh, you're not on the same page they are, right? Um, on these other things. Um, and then confess Christ all over the place kind of privately. By the way, the great majority of Americans know that men are men and women are women, contrary to all the rot poured out in the media all the time in our, our government. Don't, don't be afraid of this. I mean, uh, be afraid of it, you know, I mean, our, our government needs to get their act together, but, but do, look, it's just reality, right? Um, if I stood up here 20 years ago and said, um, I'm a woman, you would laugh. Right? Um, uh, now you'd go, well, Pastor, maybe we need some <laughs> surgery for you. Um, uh, and and uh, I don't know, uh, Monty was making the great point that in, in Bethlehem, as the soldiers are coming, um, I think parents could say, oh, no, that's not a boy. Uh, that's a girl. Uh, that baby, that toddler identifies as a girl. Um, so I'm picking flowers, her picking flowers the other day. Um, so there. <laughs> and by the way, this characterization of men as always, you know, loving guns and hammers and things, and women always loving flowers and baking and stuff. I mean, baloney, that's, you know, no. I mean, there's guys that love flowers and women that love guns. Great, right? We, we got a diversity. It's good. Uh, and uh, how, how, how we let somebody get away with this the stereotypical garbage, um, and then uh, say that this means that you're actually a, a woman trapped in a man's body or whatever. Okay, 
enough of this. So, um, so uh, Daniel uh, works hard for the Persians, the Mede Persians here, um, and look at the end of verse three there. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I don't think he means the whole Persian kingdom. I think he means the whole kingdom of Babylon that's been taken by the Persians. So he, he was going to be like the regional administrator, mm -hmm. right, over the satraps uh, and, and ruling it all because he's so good. And I think Cyrus trusts him, Darius trusts him. And then verse 4 happens. Then the presidents, those other two guys, and the satraps, the 120, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. You know, they went through all of his tax records. They did, uh, you know, they uh, dug around. They looked at all the files on this laptop, see where, you know, what sites he'd been to. Um, they, you know, they, they, they scoured around finding, to find some dirt on him, uh, just like politics today, right? Um, and you're gonna find dirt on any of us, right? You dig a little, you're gonna find something. We're not, um, but uh, not Daniel. They can't find nothing, well, maybe not us, but, but uh, lots of people you're gonna find dirt on. Every governor I grew up with in Illinois, uh, you can find dirt on them. Um, but uh, so they come up with another plot, right? Uh, then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. It, this Daniel is faithful to God. They're admitting it. Um, and, uh, and so they they're now going to work with God's law to go get him. Then these presidents and satraps come by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions over there at the Babylonian zoo, I suppose. Uh, now, I, I don't know. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Okay, so the trap is set. Um, what in the world is Darius doing signing an ordinance that you got to <laughs> pray to him for 30 days and you can't pray to anybody else? Um, Steinman makes a very fascinating argument. Are you familiar with this argument on this? This is, this, is a, this is a fascinating thing. That when, when the Persian army was knocking on the Babylonian door, uh, Belshazzar... Uh, gathered, uh, and, and his dad, gathered idols from all the area temples and brought them all to Babylon to protect Babylon. Okay, how'd that go for, how'd, how's that work for you, right? Um, so they go get all their false gods. So we got, you know, the Packers and the Lions and the Wolverines and, you know, whatever. We got all the all, all our false gods all lined up to protect the city of Babylon. They brought them in from all the places where people went to pray, all the temples, uh, thinking that if you got all the gods, remember they're polytheists, the Babylonians, so they think if they got all the gods working together, they're going to be able to defeat the Persians. Okay. Um, you know, you could see a modicum of the true faith <laughs> there, can't you? Right? That where do we go when we're up against it? We go to the true God and cry out to him for help and comfort and aid and, and defense. Uh, so they did it too with their gods. Uh, so they lose and all those false gods are hanging out in, ba in the city of Babylon and uh, Babel there. And they're, so uh, 
Darius is now in the process of relocating all these idols, all these gods back to their temples uh, so people can go there to pray. But in the meantime, they're all with him or they're in transit now. So while they're in transit for 30 days, you just pray to me, okay? Um, and, and, and it might not be that he's a god. It might be, you know, hey, if you need something, ask me. I'm the guy who'll take care of your needs here for 30 days because the gods are indisposed because they're in transit, okay? So they can't answer their cell phones, but they don't have cell phones, so they can't answer your call. So while they're being moved, you just come see me. And don't, don't, don't go anywhere else. You're, you're just not gonna find them. Um, so that might be what Cyrus is doing in signing this. Um, it does appear he's not making himself a god because it's only 30 days. Um, God isn't God for 30 days, right? If you're going to be a God, you're going to be God for good, right? Um, so, uh, so that might be the argument they used with Darius to get him to sign on to this, okay? Uh, uh, oh, one other thing, the laws of the Medes and Persians, when you sign an edict, it sticks. You can't go changing it. Um, Unlike, interestingly, our government, and it's been now for, I don't know, a while, that we've, we've had uh, leaders in our government, both uh, on, I think, the federal level and on the state level, who just decided not to enforce laws, right? You got a law that's in effect, and they just decide they're not gonna enforce it. Um, and uh, you, you would not have that with the Medes and Persians. Um, I, I don't think we should have it here, here either, which I think is why there was that crazy Supreme Court ruling about Oklahoma and the Native American tribes uh, that, uh, you know, these people are under Native American rule if they're Native Americans, not under the government of Oklahoma. That, uh, I think that's because everybody knew that uh, you know, they're under U.S. law and, and state law there, and they were just enforcing it that way, but that's not actually what the law said, if I remember right. And so the Supreme Court said, hey, you guys got to change the law, right? Um, which, it, oh, you don't need a government lesson from me, but the big <laughs> problem, the big problem we're facing, I think, in our government is that the, the uh, legislative branch isn't doing their job. They're not actually writing laws. So they're distributing all their authority to the executive branch, which is putting it all in bureaucrats, right? And then they make all the rules and, and that shouldn't be that way, right? So anyway, how did I get over there? Um, well, uh, uh, laws, you know, laws are supposed to stand um, and not be revocable. Um, although this got kind of crazy with the Medes and Persians, got to the point where you, if a ruler condemned an innocent man to death and then later determined that he was wrong and the guy was innocent, uh, too late, he's already condemned to death and you can't revoke that, even though you're the ruler who imposed it, right? So, um, so I think that would make Persian rulers careful. Yes, Nathan. What is their, what is the Persians, you know, normal, yeah, um, I believe they are. I believe they're also kind of uh, polytheists as well. Um, and they're a little less uptight about this than the Babylonians, it appears, right? So, um, and this becomes an important point, might as well cover it now. In this change of rule from the Babylonians to the Persians, uh, the first thing we note is uh, uh, that in Babylon, everybody's a polytheist, but if you lost to Babylon, clearly our God, Marduk or Bel, is bigger than your God. So if you're gonna be here in Babylon, when we put up the big, you know, uh, Wolverine block M up here, right, to Marduk, then you're gonna bow down to it. Okay, because we beat you, all right? Um, uh, okay, so when, when I've been to games at Michigan State and at Michigan, um, I've 
uh, and I love Michigan and Michigan State, um, but they're not my first love. But um, I'm a polytheist when it comes to college football. And <laughs> so when I'm there at the big house, you know, I'm like, hey, through the right, you know, I'm joining it. And when I'm at Michigan State, I'm doing whatever the Michigan State fans did. I just imitated them, right? I bowed down to their, to Sparty, right? Um, uh, you know, I didn't get up there and go boomer sooner, right, in front of everybody. Um, uh, although I think if, if I would have lived, but, um, uh, uh, but that's, so when you, so to the Babylonians, when you lose to us, you've lost to our God. That's why you got to bow down to the big statue that Nebuchadnezzar sets up. Um, it's not saying that your God isn't a God. It's just saying our God beat your God. Your God's not the God of gods, and Lord of lords. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can't do that because there is no other God. Right? And the early church, uh, they had uh, the Christians, well, everybody had to offer a little bit of incense to Caesar to worship him, which I think pretty much most Romans knew this was just a bunch of hooey, but they did it because that kept the government happy. Um, but there were Christians that wouldn't because they're not going to worship Caesar. Caesar's not our God. They, and they looked to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, and they wouldn't do it. And for that, a lot of them got martyred, um, or their life became difficult. Uh, so, so that's how the Babylonians did it. The Persians, they, you know, they're not that uptight about it, it appears. Um, and in this case, this is praying to no other gods for only 30 days. You know, you're sort of fasting from praying to your God while your gods get relocated, probably, right? So it's, it's not as uptight as the Babylonians that way. Um, in, in Babylonian thinking, the Jews are exiles uh, that have been, you know, they're slaves to uh, bond servants to uh, Babylon, uh, Babylon um, uh, and they're exiled from Israel. It, under the Persians, they're allowed to return. Do you want to go back? Yeah. Um, the Babylonians tear down the temple in Jerusalem. The Persians are going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Right? So, I mean, there's quite a difference here. Um, and which is to tell you this whole chapter, well, at chapter 5 and chapter 6 are telling you that the Persians wiping out Babylon was really good news for the faithful. And God is working in history, just like Daniel said back there in chapter 2 with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar when he told him his dream about the, uh, the big statue and the stone that knocked it all down and grew into the biggest kingdom, a uh, Christ kingdom, um, that it's God who raises up and drops down. And he's, he's doing it. He's taking care of his people for their good. All right. Um, so thank you for that question. Nathan, did I answer? Okay, did we get, get it covered? Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, verse 10. And I, I still remember, Joe, were you with me at uh, the, the Luther home in uh, Peoria when an old retired pastor, I bet he was 62 or something, um, <laughs> was, is hardly alive. Um, he was, uh, he preached on this text and he talked about, remember, uh, about the woman that, ne and he was, he was kind of a famous, he was the, the father of, oh, who's, he's the father of a member of Redeemer Peoria. But I, I forget who it was. Dear, wonderful man, what a great sermon. He talked about how, you know, uh, Daniel here goes back to his habit of praying um, even after this edict. He doesn't change. And it reminded him of this woman he went to visit in the hospital. And this woman always knelt when she prayed. When she prayed at home, she always knelt. So pastor does this devotion with her. She's in the hospital. She's pretty sick. And he says, let's pray. And she climbs out of bed. Yeah, this takes a bit. And kneels on the floor of the hospital room. And he's like, you don't have to do, no, you don't. And she, that's how I always pray. Right? And, um, 
uh, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. And, and, um, and he said, you know, I've noticed here at this, uh, at, at this hillside village is the name of the place. Um, I've noticed here that at meals, some of us aren't praying before we eat. I bet you all prayed before you eat, ate at home. I don't think you should stop your habit, right? I thought it was, that was a great thing to say. Say it, and he said it in a you know, gentle way, but also, you know. <laughs> um, well, here's Daniel, right? When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, and you know, he's meticulous about keeping the rules. We know that. They, can't, they haven't found anything wrong with him. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees <clears throat> three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Uh, so here's Daniel. So this edict comes out. You can't pray to anyone except King Darius. And Daniel goes, okay, um, you know, if there's any street repair issues, I'll go to Darius. Um, but when it comes to giving thanks to the ruler of the universe, I'm, I'm still going to pray to him. And uh, now there's some interesting things here. His, he, he's got his windows open. The disciples in the upper room, door is closed and locked, right? Um, uh, he's facing Jerusalem. What direction do you face when you pray? When I'm praying at the altar there, I'm facing Jerusalem, everybody. I'm facing east, okay? You know, um, Pastor Krieger saw to it that the, the, that the celebrant at our altar was facing east, right? Um, our church is kind of backwards that way. Most churches face east, right? We face west, but that's so that the celebrant is facing east as he prays on our behalf, right? That's kind of fun. Um, uh, by the way, does it matter what direction you pray? No. Why? Where's Jesus? Everywhere. So what direction is everywhere? Right? Every direction is everywhere. So there we go, right? You don't, we don't have to do that. But, boy, if you go into the chapel at uh, Blodgett Hospital, there's a little kneeler with a, or a little rug, um, roped off little thing, for uh, Muslims to pray toward Mecca, you know, and they got it angled the right way to get, you know. Um, yeah, you don't have to do that because our God's everywhere and in charge of all things. Um, but then, right, the promise was uh, that the temple would be rebuilt in Jerusalem. He's praying toward Jerusalem. It, it, this, is, this is confessing his hope in uh, in the return of Israel to Jerusalem, okay? Which is beautiful, isn't it? And he kneels to pray. Um, lots of prayer happened in the Old and New Testament where people are standing. Paul does say that he bends the knee as he prays um, for, I believe, the Philippians, or is it the Ephesians? I can't remember at the moment. Um, uh, but that meant he knelt. Um, Solomon, when he dedicates, uh, the temple, um, they had a platform built that he got up on and he knelt when he dedicated uh, the temple. So this, uh, there is present to kneeling while praying. Um, we had uh, uh, recently, somebody was here visiting. Oh, I know what it was. It was when the uh, school, when we had the school advent evening prayer service and was talking to these dear people from India um, uh, who, whose uh, youngest son goes to our school and his uh, slightly older sister who's in college, he's what, in first grade or something crazy like that. Um, uh, what a gap. Um, anyway, he, uh, she was here and they were sitting in front of us and I noticed you know, that they knelt to pray and all that. And I, um, so afterward, I'm, interested she goes to cornerstone and all this and i'm like you know so what do you think of kneeling and she's like you know i actually like this right this and i said yeah it's really hard to be arrogant when you're on your knees right so uh, uh daniel uh humbles himself before the lord uh three times a day prays uh and gives thanks and praise to god 
He's in captivity, Daniel. He should be whining. No, he's giving thanks and praise to God. Um, and he keeps doing it. And he does it with the windows open. And guess what else he must have done? I suppose. A Steinman doesn't agree with me on this. I don't think. At least he doesn't mention it. He, well, he does it out loud. If there were a time for silent prayer, right? <laughs> right? Um, wouldn't this be it? Wouldn't this be a time to close the windows so they can't see you kneeling and then silently pray? But nope, windows open toward Jerusalem, I think out loud, on his knees, so everybody could tell he's praying, right? Although, not in a pharisaical way, going on the street corner and going, look at me, how great I am, right? By the way, so we pastors pray, um, and we pray in front of y'all, and you can see us pray sometimes, and we do it in kind of fancy robes, are we violating Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount about the Pharisees who pray so that others will see them, you know, and they have their reward? No. No, that's not a violation of Jesus' word. Here's why. Um, look, is it good for pastors to pray? Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, uh, why do pastors wear vestments? to hide the pastor, okay? Why do football teams wear uniforms, right? So you know what team they're on. And like Notre Dame, they don't even put their name on their back, right? Because they're, they're, they're just the team. They're hiding who they are. That's what vestments do. They hide us. You, and in fact, if we could come up with a way, maybe we could with COVID, come up with a way to cover our faces. You know, at least when I'm preaching, you'd be spared the ugliness, right? Um, this would be a good thing. We, we try to cover up as much as the pastor as possible so that you go, oh, that's the pastor, right? And you know what to call us, pastor. And you know, this is the guy sent by Jesus to declare forgiveness to me. And that's why he's in uniform, right? So that's what all the vestments are about, right? They also tell you what kind of season of the church year we're in. That's why the color, right? But, but it's not... It's the opposite of what we all think. We all think it's to call attention to the person. Um, I was looking yesterday at all the wedding pictures we have in our uh, uh, old best guest bedroom. Um, we've got uh, both our parents' weddings and ours. And in all of them, every, all the women are wearing white dresses, right? And all of them are not showy people, right? But, why are they wearing white dresses? Because they're confessing Ephesians 5, that in baptism, Christ, our true bridegroom, sees us without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, right? So they, these brides were all announcing uh, that it's Christ that matters, right? And, you, no, and nobody goes, oh, that's kind of showy of the bride to wear white, you know, to stand out like that, right? We all go, well, of course she's wearing white, right? Um, and, and honestly, the more that we cover up of her, probably the better too, actually, for that matter, right? Um, uh, um, what, oh, what was that in the office where the one girl wears white to a wedding um, because it was an emergency? Uh, she looked better in white. So that, anyway, um, yeah, you don't do that, right? You let the bride be the one to wear the white. Um, so, uh, so this, so you, you see us praying, and we happen to be investments, but that's just you happen to see us praying. I mean, we're not praying so that you see us praying. I'm praying because I need my Lord's help. And, and Pastor Swim and Pastor Show as well, right? So, so Daniel here too, right? So, um, so he does this, and, uh, and then verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel. So they're all in cahoots together, right? On this, they're plotting against him. These men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said to the king concerning the injunction. So first, make sure you got your facts right. Build your syllogism here, right? Of an argument. Oh, king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions located on the northeast sector of the... Whatever. Um, right? And uh, 
by the way, when people ask you questions like this, did you say, did you, you know, you're kind of going, uh-oh, what's mm -hmm. coming, right? Um, and the king answered and said, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Which, amen, all right? Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, and now the camera turns and looks at Darius, and what happens to his face? Oh, right? Uh, he is not happy about this. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day to his God. It's implied there. Um, by the way, what about these charges? Is he one of the exiles from Judah? Yes. Does he pay no attention to the king? No, he pays attention to the king on everything. That's why he rose to the top, okay? He just is disagreeing this one thing, and he paid attention to it, he heard it, but he's not gonna obey it, right? Because he's gonna obey God, not man, right? Um, and what's the other silly charge they have here? Um, or the injunction you have signed. Um, well, yeah, he is disobeying this silly overreach of a rule. Right, um, but my goodness, he is the—he is more loyal than the rest of these guys to the king. I think that's clear. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So, uh, boy, do you happen to know any other case where a faithful man, um, a really good man, was brought up on charges uh, based on the law uh, and uh, the, the judge in the case, the ruler in the case, did not want to find the guy uh, guilty or put him to death because he knew the guy was actually innocent, but there was a crowd stirred up who is saying, you better bring it along, you better do, we need law and order around here, right? Um, boy, sound familiar at all to you? Yeah, it does sound like our Lord Jesus, doesn't it? There's some more parallels coming. Uh, let's see, and then, uh, let's see here. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. Uh, did we say this already? Mm -hmm. And um, Oh yeah, right, we did. Then verse 16, excuse me. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, isn't this beautiful? May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, does remind you of Jesus being put into a tomb and uh, Pilate ordering that the grave be sealed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, marked here, by the way, uh, Darius might be outsmarting these bad guys. Um, uh, because he's sealing it, but he's also making them seal it. We're not, it, so we're going to leave it up to Daniel with the lions, right? And we're not going to go, oh, well, the lions were lazy on their job. They couldn't beat the pack, never mind. They couldn't uh, defeat uh, Daniel, so we're going to drop a bomb in there or, you know, shoot, you know, with arrows, shoot uh, Daniel or hang him or something, right? That this is going to be it. Right? The, the agreement was he gets thrown into the lion den, the den of lions, mm -hmm. and, then we're, and then when that's over, that's over. So, so that he's getting them to agree to the terms as well, right? Um, uh, but of course, this does remind us of the stone at Jesus' grave. Um, and let's see here. Uh, then at break of, oh wait, excuse me. 
I, I skipped. Then the king went to his palace, verse 18, and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Uh, isn't this interesting? Darius actually is concerned about Daniel. I don't know. Does he love him? I guess, it sure acts like it. He cares about him. Um, he knows this is an injustice. Remember, he wanted to put him as the highest guy in the kingdom, you know, for running Babylon. Um, and so no entertaining, no, no food or drink. And then at break of day, which is what we should have done on Easter Sunday, um, we all should have we all should have had, as I like to put it, had our lawn chairs set up there before sunrise, ready to see the resurrected Jesus. You know, with go Jesus signs, welcome home Jesus, you won the battle Jesus. But what are the women going to do? Take care of a stone cold dead body. Right? They love him, but they don't believe him. Right? Um, uh, here, the king loves Daniel, um, but I, I don't know if he believes that God's going to do this. He hopes, right? Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. That is a beautiful phrase, a title uh, used in scripture a few times. Um, and indeed, our God is a living God. Um, uh, uh, this shows up in Deuteronomy, in Joshua, and in Matthew. Um, I th is this... Uh, well, God is the God of the living, Jesus says, when they try to trick him with that, that poor woman who in their story had, had, had seven husbands and they all died, and then... And then she finally happily died. Um, and then what, um, in eternal life, which man's going to be your husband? He says, you don't know what you're talking about. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. It's the God of Jacob and so forth, right? Um, and they're not dead. They're alive, thank you. Um, but so anyway, I mean, what a confession, interestingly. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, Live forever. I don't know. We have, so has the spoon been removed yet? Um, I don't think so. So we, maybe that should be muffled. Oh, cool. Live forever. Um, and that my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done mm -hmm. no harm. In the Veggie Tales version, uh, da Daniel and the lions had pizza together. Um, no, no, they didn't eat anything. They went on a fast. Isn't that interesting? Um, and and they're fasting because the angel, well, an angel of the Lord, perhaps the angel of the Lord, that is the pre-incarnate Christ, the one who showed up with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, shows up down there with Daniel. Do you realize when you're in trouble, Who's with you? He was with his Old Testament saints. He's with you no matter what you're up against, right? He's there with you. Um, and uh, uh, then the king uh, was exceedingly glad. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, wait a second. I, I skipped a part. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. King, I didn't do anything against you, right? You're my king. O king, live forever is the greeting for a king. Still does it. Long live the king, right? He, um, uh, Daniel's a loyal servant because that's what God called him to, right? If our president walked into this room, what would we all do? Stand up, all right? I don't care which president is. I don't care if you like him or don't like him, you stand up. It's our president, right? The governor walked in. I'd stand up. I am standing up. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't sit up, right? I mean, I'd stand up, right? Um, well, that's, that's what we do. We're respectful. We're Christians. We know that God put these people in authority, right? Um, and that's how Daniel lives. 
Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found in him. Sound like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a bit? Huh? And Jesus coming out of his grave, although still with the nail wounds and the spear wound to comfort us and encourage us, right? So Daniel was taken out of the den. No kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, just like Jesus, trusted, he entrusted himself to the Father, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they and their children and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of, <clears throat> of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Uh, now, is that fair? Um, maybe according to law of Medes and Persians, it's fair. But, uh, and there is, there is this sense in Persian law, right, that if you falsely accuse somebody, whatever punishment you were seeking for them is given to you. Um, so, uh, you know, our government doesn't work that way. I don't, I'm... I think we, we might be better off if we did a little bit, right? Um, but in Jewish law, this would be completely unlawful. There's nothing right about killing this man's, uh, these men's wives and children, their whole household, for what the guy did wrong, unless they were in collusion with it, which seems really unlikely here. So, yeah. What did they do with Nathan? Yeah, well, so that's interesting. The Hebrew is a little unclear. Was it just him and all of his stuff? Or was it him and his family? There's a, there's a debate on, we were having this debate at men's Bible study, actually. Um, and if his family was included, they were involved in it. They knew the secret, okay? Um, if his family was not involved in it, they weren't. They didn't know the secret. It's, and it... It is nebulous which way it goes. Okay, um, so you. Pardon me. It seems like all of a sudden the guy's burying something in the tent. Well, maybe. Hey, kids, look over there. <laughs> yeah. Honey, go to get a go to the store and yeah, go go to Herman's Boy and get some coffee, will you? Right. Um, don't look over here. You know, um, I got a present for you. Anyway, um, so they. These lions are ferocious. This is letting you know this wasn't just that the lions are. Never mind. I won't, I won't say it. Um, that are you know uh, impotent or whatever. They're they're real and they're really hungry. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Boy, that shows up all over the New Testament. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, now this does not fit if Darius is just ruling part of, part of the Persian Empire, but if he's ruling the whole thing, if it's Cyrus, this edict makes total sense. Um, that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, not like these gods that were relocating back to their temples, these things of stone and wood and whatever. Um, his enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed, even if you kill all the little baby boys in Bethlehem, and his dominion shall be to the end, even if you plot against him. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, now you, you say, well, that sounds like two guys. Yeah, it does sound that way, but... There's the ep-exegetical use of uh, the vav um, in Hebrew. The vav is, is uh, the simple letter at the beginning of the word, which means and. Um, in Greek, that word and is chi, and there's an ep-exegetical use of chi as well, of, of and. Um, it, me, it would be like this way, of reading it this way, that during the reign of Darius, that is, 
the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay. Um, I probably should have pulled that argument out first, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, uh, that, but um, that, it, it, it's a, this happens, and it happens elsewhere in Daniel, where Daniel uses a vav uh, epic suggestively, as uh, in other words, you know, um, uh, using it that way. Like we do, you know, like you'll identify a person by two names in the, you know, pastor, that is Dave Fleming or whatever, right? That same kind of thing, all right? Um, we just don't do it with the word and, I think, in English. But they did in both Hebrew and Greek. Unless you have a dual parish. Unless you have a dual parish. There you go. <laughs> He's the pastor of, yeah, uh, and that. <laughs> You have the Bright Student Award to Pastor Gale. Ten years in Montana where they have lots of dual <laughs> So guys, isn't this amazing? Right? And you could see why in the lectionary, which I praised this morning, um, you could see why in the lectionary, Daniel chapter 6 ends up where on the church here? Easter Sunday morning. Right? Right? This isn't this pregnant, um, where uh, the, lo the, the Satan, who is a devouring lion, seek, or a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, uh, seeks to swallow up Jesus using death, um, but he's not able to touch Jesus. Right? And uh, Jesus, who was sealed in the tomb, uh, the stone is rolled away to show you that he's already out. And he's fine, and there's no harm on his body, and there'll be no harm on yours either, no matter who kills you or how you die, right? This, our God is the God of the living. He's the living God whose kingdom will never fail us. So, I mean, it might be we end up under a government like uh, Babylon or the Persian government, and there might be people plotting against us. So what? Our king is able to deliver us, and he will, eternally. Um, and, uh, and so we just keep crying out to him, facing him, and uh, handing all of our troubles and worries and fears and needs and thanksgivings to him, uh, for he is the God who cares for us. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to Daniel to serve well and wisely, to be faithful to you. Thank you for protecting him uh, to give us a beautiful picture of the saving work of your son and our coming resurrection, even uh, through the jaws of death. Lord, sustain uh, your church everywhere, particularly our persecuted brothers and sisters, and make us joyful and bold to serve well with joyful confidence in you, our God, who will not fail us, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, one point I forgot uh, to mention. Uh, at the end here, Daniel isn't made the governor of Babylon. Did you catch that? Uh, uh, why not? I, I think Darius is a smart guy. Uh, Cyrus has figured out that these guys don't particularly care for a Jew ruling over uh, Babylon. So he's going to pick somebody else. I, plus, Daniel is nearing 80 years old. And he might have said, I'll be glad to be an advisor, but I don't want to be the senior pastor anymore. Okay, so anyway, so, okay. Blessings, Daniel. I, yeah. I mean, I just looked up from the news. They said that the Medes and Persians wiped out Babylon, destroyed yeah. Babylon. Yeah, yeah, right. There's a lot of people that are refugees. Oh, right, right. They, de they destroyed the, you know, they killed the king and all that. They took it over. But they, they destroyed the whole city. They knocked out all the buildings. Um, and that's probably a slight exaggeration. Um, you know, uh, you, because you actually want to use all this, the good stuff, right? It, yeah, we yeah. didn't do that to Jericho. We didn't, when, when, when would, you, would you say the Americans destroyed... The, what about like the, the people back then where yeah. they had to worry about their kids killing them? 
Yeah, good. I mean, you know, how yeah. many times did a king get killed by his own kids because yeah. they wanted to be king? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that will let Pastor Swim answer <laughs> that <laughs> next week. Great question. Don't worry, because I'll be in Sunday school and don't have to bring me. <laughs>